Now I would like to introduce today's speakers. Maddox Casey has been with Warren Averett since 2004 and is a senior manager in the firm's healthcare division. He also serves as a leader within the firm's healthcare client practice group. Maddox specializes in healthcare reform, federal tax, payroll, and other professional services. Maddox resides in Birmingham with his wife and three children. Say Evans joined Warren Everett in 2006 and has more than nine years of public accounting experience. Say is a senior manager in the firm's healthcare consulting group and specializes in working with medical and dental practices in matters such as compensation and incentive plans, tax compliance, year-end planning consultation, and personal income tax planning for closely held entities. Say also has expertise in medical real estate issues including feasibility analysis, cost segregation studies, and tax planning for purchase, sale transactions, and ownership changes. Maddox and Say have dedicated their careers to specializing in servicing healthcare facilities, physicians, and their medical practices. It is my pleasure now to turn the program over to Maddox and Say. Thanks, Mandy. We Thank appreciate you. it. Hi, I'm Maddox Casey, and this is Say Evans, and we appreciate uh, you joining us tonight to talk our, our first of a series. First topic is the events that are driving the purchase, the sell, or the merge of a medical practice. So we thought we would spend the first uh, segment or so talking about the environment, the current environment they're in, the economic conditions, the reasons why we are seeing medical practices or physicians wanting to sell their practices. Uh, buy into a medical practices. We will also talk about tonight the possibilities of selling your practice to a hospital. Uh, we will talk about merging your practice in with a bigger practice. There's a lot of different items that we're going to cover tonight. Uh, hopefully one of those topics is either something you're considering now or something you might consider in the future. So first of all, we're going to talk about the healthcare environment and the reasons why this is happening. Um, one of the main items is driving uh, the buying and selling of practices is the Affordable Care Act, uh, affection, affectionately known as Obamacare. Uh, call it as you want, but uh, it has changed the landscape, the environment of the way a medical practice operates um, currently. One of the biggest things we're seeing here, um, and say he's going to be able to chime, we're going to all chime in here, um, is the fact that deductibles went way up under these plans. And uh, we saw where we used to have a deductible, let's say 10 years ago, of maybe $500. And we used to have co-pays of as small as $15 or $20 or $30. You're probably seeing this in your practice now. Now we have people who have deductibles as high as you know, $6,300 $6, for an individual and $12,700 for a family. Um, this is driving practices a little bit crazy with the fact that now some of the patient, some of the responsibility that used to be on the insurance is now on the patient. Therefore, it makes your responsibility as a practice to actually collect that money. Maddox, have you seen any of the practices you deal with uh, have issues in the first quarter of 14 with the deductibles because they haven't met their deductible for the year? You know, they've got a $5,000 deductible. Yeah. Um, have you seen any practices be negatively affected by that? Oh, yeah. I mean, we had just an example. We spoke to a client. Um, two weeks ago, their revenues were down uh, $600,000 quarter by quarter, quarter of 2014 versus the first quarter of 2013. Now, I need to put that in perspective. They are about a four to $5 million quarterly practice, $20 million practice, but still $600,000 on 500, you know, $5 million is, is a, big, a significant jump. That's 10, 12% down. A lot of that is due to the fact that the deductibles are going up. Um, and they're having a harder time collecting this money. They could also be financing that money uh, through patients. Patient walks in, says, I have a, dedu you know, a deductible of $6,300, uh, which you should be doing, and we'll probably cover this, te this tip somewhere uh, in a further series on how to collect money from patients. But you should be saying, I need all the money up front. Because if we don't get that money up front, if we don't collect that money when they walk in the door, we may never see that money again, uh, especially if you're a specialist, you have large infusion drugs, if you go give a $3,000 infusion without collecting that money from the patient, you may never see that money. Um, what about your practices, say? Are you seeing the same thing? Same situation. Mm -hmm. uh, it really depends on the payer mix. A 
lot of the practices that migrated away from Medicare patients are feeling the pain now, um, and the you know the practices that have a heavier heavier Medicare patient base are kind of sitting in a better position. So it, it just kind of part of it's the 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 payer mix, That's right. and then a lot of it is you know how well is your front desk. Collecting, collecting money when the patient presents because that's your best opportunity to collect that's right. that money. We, we used to say if you had a heavy Medicaid, Medicare or Medicaid population or payer mix, um, you're getting lower reimbursements at that time, but it was hard, you know, you didn't really matter because commercial payers paid. But now if you have a lot of commercial payers, uh, understandably, you, you may not be able to get that money from the uh, payers, and especially if you have a lot of exchange, depending on what state you're in, uh, what state you're watching this from, um, it depends would tell us how big your exchange population is. In Alabama, uh, which is where we're broadcasting from currently, uh, we, we haven't seen a lot of exchange patients walk into our, our, our practices yet, not near the amount that we would pro probably see in other states. So that's one of the things that's driving the current environment. Another thing is just increasing administrative burdens. Um, you can, you probably have a lot of these, and, and we've, we've seen a lot of administrative burden, HIPAA, OSHA compliance, um, you know, IT security risk assessments, which is part of the HIPAA Act back in September. There are a lot of administrative burdens that are driving people to say, I'm done with this. I want to, I want to go ahead and just sell out of my practice. I want to be part of a bigger group where I don't have to deal with this administration anymore. Uh, that's another driving factor um, for closing it. For EMR cost, uh, the cost of implementing that, the cost of having to manage that, make sure it's working effectively, you know, things that in the past uh, a physician hasn't had to take control of and could focus on practicing medicine. It's moving away from practicing medicine, moving into more management of a practice, and taking care of things that maybe the insurance companies or the government were handling before. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, another part of here is, you know, ICD-10. Even though that's been pushed back officially till October 1 of 2015, uh, ICD-10 is, is at some point going to drive uh, cash flow into a crunch for most practices. Um, HIPAA requirements, rack audits, qualifying, you know, reporting initiatives, you, you know, e-prescribe e, e is what happened last, uh, still going on, but uh, last June you were required to submit the 10 and the 25 at their incremental dates. Um, there's just a lot of administrative burdens that uh, you haven't had to deal with in the past in, in jumping through those hurdles. Another requirement, or another big push here in people selling or are buying medical practices is the age of physicians. Uh, we have an aging physician population. Um, it's, it, there are not many, as many students going through medical school coming out uh, as there are physicians that are currently in the work, workforce. And some of that's due to the baby boomer population ready to get out. In 2008, and Say would probably tell you this, the economy was down. And so many physicians said, I'm going to have to work another three, four, five, six years because my retirement is not as high as, as I would like it to be. The market crashed. It took a 30 to 40 percent uh, jump uh, decrease. But now, as the market has recovered, we're above 16,000 points. Uh, you, some of you guys, are ready to hang it up. Uh, your retirement plans have recovered. We've seen 20, 30 percent increases in the market, uh, and now you're saying I'm done. And, and put that on top of some of these administrative burdens we've mentioned. Um, it, it's it's becoming the age is one of the driving region, reasons for selling or buying or getting out of your medical practice. Yeah, a lot of it, like Maddox mentioned, the age of the physician is a big factor. Uh, the folks that are a little bit closer to the, the end of their career um, are deciding to retire now a lot of times just because of the frustrations that we've already mentioned. Um, and a lot of that depends on their ability. If they've saved for retirement and they have the financial means to retire, a lot of them are retiring early. Um, the ones that, that don't may have to work a little bit longer. But the, the physicians retiring early need to have a plan in place to transition that practice or sell or you know, monetize what they've built in their practice and pass that on to another physician that can basically carry their torch. And what we're going to talk about today um, details some of those issues. Yeah, we'll, we'll jump into the specifics of what you need to look at when you're ready to buy and sell. Um, the other part of that is that you know, some of our older physicians want to work less is EMR is required now, they don't want to go through that. We want to stay on our paper charts as long as we possibly can. I don't want to buy the EMR. I don't want to deal with the EMR. Uh, we know that causes issues. Um, whenever you have an EMR, implementing that system 
um, never goes as smoothly as you think it does. It always takes a hit to revenues. So, um, and usually older physicians, stereotype here, are less tech, tech savvy uh, than some of the younger physicians. And especially if you're a solo practitioner and you don't have so, a younger partner or a younger physician in your group who can be what we would recommend a team leader and implement, implementer uh, of the actual EMR itself uh, makes it even more difficult because you're driving or developing your own templates for your EMR, which is, is difficult enough to practice medicine on top of that. So uh, the other thing is bigger is better. Uh, this is a push we're seeing right now you know, with a lot of practices. Um, it's, we call it, you can call them super groups, and there are a lot of super groups going on uh, in, in the whole country right now. And the reasons why bigger may be better, and we have reasons why bigger is not better, but one of the reasons may be is the overhead split. You know, let's split the economies of scale. Let's go from four physicians to eight physicians. I talked to a client today who said, I'm ready to bring on, uh, they have six physicians, and they're in talks right now to bring five more physicians onto their group. And the reason being is that they want to become a super group. They want to capture the referrals. They want to split the overhead in half. Now they're eventually economies of scale the way we're going to work that is one receptionist may be able to take care of four or five and two receptionists may be able to take care of ten at some point you've got to hire that additional uh, person but for the most part bigger is better on cost uh, we're, we're going to split that um, you also have some negotiating power with your purchasing contracts if you've got 11 groups 11 physician group versus a two physician group um, you're probably not going to get as good a deal on some of what you're buying whether it be supplies equipment uh, larger lab equipment. Also, if you're looking at to negotiate contracts, depending on the state that you're in. Again, we're broadcasting from Alabama, and uh, our 800-pound gorilla in the state is Blue Cross. So you're probably not going to get a whole lot of negotiating room. But if you're in a different state watching this, you probably have some room to negotiate your contract, depending on the size of your group. And ACOs has been a hot topic the past couple of years. That's slowly growing in popularity in Alabama but a larger practice would have a better position to negotiate contracts with an ACO, whereas smaller practices may not. And ACO could use them against each other in a negotiating process, but that's just another instance of bigger being better. And you know, we still have to see how the ACO situation is gonna play out, but um, yeah, that's definitely been a driving factor in a lot of physicians' minds. Yeah, and while cost is the driving factor, I think while we're here on this topic, we talk a, a minute about um, as many groups as we've put together. We've probably broken apart the same amount. And the reason being is that the reason you're in private practice is for the autonomy of, what, of having your own practice. And if you don't establish the right corporate governance, the right executive team that's in charge, um, making decisions now becomes, used to be one or two partners, now becomes 13 partners. And everybody is, has their own agenda. Uh, I want to go here, I want to buy this, I want to do this. You've got to have the right corporate governance. You've also got to do a couple, three things with, with saying I consider the way to bring a group together. You've got to practice clinically, uh, ethically, and financially together. Clinically, if you have a group that splits overhead equally, which a lot of groups do, and you decide that you want to work four days, and another one of your physician wants to work two and a half days. Well, we've got we've got some. That's actually a financial issue, but we've got some clinical issues that may happen there. I'm gonna, we're going to split everything equally. We're going to split revenue equally, uh, and we're just all going to take the same amount of money home at the end of the day. We actually had a group that had this uh, recently, and some people are saying, "Well, what's the reason? Why would I even show up to practice?" Well, that's a good reason. But if we're not on the same page clinically, if we're not treating our patients in the same manner. Uh, we're not splitting our revenue in the same, in the same manner. We've got, we've got some issues that could possibly drive a group apart. Uh, ethically, um, the way you look at a group. Uh, we've had a group where uh, we had a person who used curse words all the time. And that, that, that drove this group apart because two of, the, two of the physicians said they cannot treat patients that way. They can't use curse words in front of the patients. They can't use it in front of my staff. And it didn't matter. They could have been great clinicians together. They could have worked financially well together. But if that issue can't, can't work together, the group's going to be driven apart. So there are some things in there when we put bigger is better, but maybe not always in parentheses. Uh, there are some things you need to look at. And then, of course, financially, I talked about the way you split overhead, split revenue, uh, you know, split expenses, the way you spend your money. What should we buy? Should we buy an ultrasound? Should we buy some, some more lab equipment? If you don't have the proper corporate governance, two or three, make four people maybe making a decision for a large group, 
you're going to have some issues. Uh, you're going to have 13 people sitting in a boardroom, and someone has to make the final call, just like of any other group, uh, whenever you're looking at it. The other one is hospital acquisitions, and I'm going to let Say talk a second about uh, why is that a driving factor for to sell your medical practice right now. Well, uh, that's been a popular thing lately. Hospitals are buying practices, and generally it's been primary care, but it's expanding into different specialties. Um, and this is attractive to many physicians for a number of reasons. One is the hospital may offer them a buyout for their stock for their for their practice, which is a payday for the physician, which is attractive. The other the other positives in the physician's mind is guaranteed salary, um, especially in this environment where uncertainty uh, with with reimbursements and the deductibles and collecting that money, the guaranteed salary is attractive. Uh, access to technology that the hospital system may have that the physician may not be able to obtain on their own in, in a practice. Uh, recruiting advantages and uh, oftentimes the compensation for a physician can be tied to other metrics other than collections in a hospital system. It can be tied to RVUs or some uh, MGMA average or something like that where they're, uh, they're not having to worry about the collections on seeing patients and they can be paid by some other metric so they're, they feel like they're being compensated for their work instead of uh, what comes in the door which they don't always have control over. Um, and there's no need for you as a physician to have a, a transition plan in place, bring in another physician to buy you out. The hospital basically take, you know, is, is, your, is your transition plan. Um, but when you're considering a hospital acquisition, there are negatives that you also need to, to factor in. Those are, you're gonna lose your practice, you're gonna lose your autonomy, and you're not the one making decisions all the time. You're gonna to have to yield to the system and, and uh, do what they say needs to be done, how it needs to be done. And the benefits typically aren't as good in a hospital, or hospital system as they are in your privately owned practice. Uh, it, you also need to consider the impact on referral sources. If you move from one location to this hospital system, uh, are you potentially alienating a referral source? Are they going to send it to another physician that's in a that's closer? Uh, there's just many different factors you need to consider other than does this offer on a sheet of paper look attractive to me? Um, Maddox, what do you have anything to add? Well, I mean, we have you know we've seen the enticing offers that uh, hospitals have. You know, for some of the larger specialty groups, the offers are we'll keep your compensation the same, we'll take away all the administrative burdens from you. You just come in and practice medicine. And uh, that is glorious, and I think it is a attractive for many physicians to do that right now. Um, a couple of concerns I would have when we're looking at that is, you know, you are at the mercy of the hospital. I had a call four weeks ago from a physician. It was in private practice, but the private practice is owned by the hospital. So they dictate everything about the private practice. They pay, they pay the money, they allocate, they hire the people. So I don't even know if I call that private practice. Um, but the hospital's in financial trouble, and they fired the CEO, they fired the CFO, and they can't make ends meet at the hospital. So the letter came down from the hospital to all physicians, saying every physician needs to agree to take a 10% cut on their base salary right now. Well, there's not a whole lot we can do here. Um, you know, this physician it happened to be an older physician who wasn't gonna bolt, uh, they, he did have a non-compete, the state, uh, whether that was enforceable or not, he had non-compete where he couldn't go leave. Um, he had really nowhere to go. Uh, my only advice to him was maybe try to get something out of it. Maybe get some transparency of how your practice is doing. Maybe maybe get out of your non-compete if you can, if you agree to that 10% cut. But that was a 10% cut on about a $550,000 salary. Uh, so that's a, that's a pretty big chunk, and I didn't have a whole lot to say. That, that doesn't have in pra private practice. Whenever you own your practice, as we well know, you, know, you take some of the risk out of it, but you also take some of the reward and the ability to generate uh, you know, an unlimited stream of money uh, at some point. So um, I think that's good to cover. So we've spent about 25 minutes talking about the current environment, some of the reasons why you may be buying and selling your practice or merging. Uh, I think we'll jump in now into the nuts and bolts of what we think you should look at, some of the considerations uh, of what you should look at when you're buying or selling your practice. The first one is your buy-sell agreement. Um, first of all, 
you should have a buy sell agreement. If you don't have a buy sell agreement, you need to go ahead and get one drafted. Uh, the buy sell agreement is one of the most important important documents in place when you have a group of two or more, and, and that dictates the dictates the terms of how you get in and out of this practice. Uh, what are the terms, the conditions, how is it paid? Um, you know, it, it provides what we call a clear methodology of the purchase and the triggering events. Uh, what's gonna trigger a termination from someone? What's the notice you have to give for terminating or buying or selling your practice? Um, it also protects you upon disability or death. Now, say and are, are not attorneys. Uh, we, don't, we don't have JD after our name. So anything we say here is not legal advice. Um, but we are going to talk about um, what the common forms are and what type of things are considered in a buy-sell agreement. So first of all is, is a stock purchase. If you're looking at a stock purchase and how do you value the, pre the practice. Um, many physicians now that we've met with, when you ask them the value of their practice, um, they tell you a very large number. And uh, you kind of sit back and think, why is your practice worth it, worth this? I actually spoke to residents in, uh, north of here about when you buy into a practice, understanding exactly what are you buying. Um, most medical practices, I said most, do not have any value. Uh, and the reason is that we as a CPAs, uh, on a cash basis, strip most of the profits out uh, every, every single year. And, and you've noticed this if you own your own practice. Which means at the end of the day, the equity inside of that practice is very, very little. And there's really two things that, that have any value. Your assets and your accounts receivable, which haven't been collected and don't show up on the financials yet. So when you look at the book value of a practice and you're ready to sell your practice, we look at the equity inside the practice. And a lot of practices actually have negative, ne negative equity in the practice, which means we may have a loan in the books of $150,000 that's running the working capital of the practice and nothing to back that up as collateral other than future cash flows because banks will loan us money knowing that we have the cash flows to, to sustain and pay that note. Uh, which means at the end of the day, we're left with a negative equity in the books. And the only thing we could sell would be our, be our hard assets. Our Equipment. And <coughs> for practice, the assets are going to be purchased uh, recorded on a tax return. A lot of times your financial statements are kept on income tax basis, cash basis, financial statements. And when you buy a piece of equipment, let's say you spend, last year you spent $100,000 buying a piece of equipment. Um, if you paid cash for that, or if, even if you took out a loan to buy it, you could have taken Section 179 depreciation, which means you expense that asset in the year you purchased it. And if you expense it all in one year, that asset has a net book value of zero. So when you go to sell your, your practice, if it's a stock purchase, the true book value of those assets would be zero. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what we see is, you know, the real, the real value of that asset may be, you know, kind of like a car, you drive it off the lot, it's, you know, worth half of whatever you paid for it. But the, you know, the $100,000 asset you, you purchased may be worth $80,000, but the book value is zero. A lot of the times we see a provision in a stock purchase for, for a buy-sell that says the asset will not be less than 20% of the original cost of that asset. So no matter how old that asset gets, it's never going to be worth less than $20,000. And you know, as the practice goes on over the years, that can be a substantial amount of money. So uh, depending on the specialty, you know, the asset per portion of that stock purchase can be significant. Uh, but really, you need to have a provision in the buy sale that sets a, a, a floor for what those assets are worth. And depending on what side of the party you're at, it depends on what kind of price you really want. If you're the buyer, uh, you, you really want a really low price. And if you're the seller, of course, you want a really high price. And the question is, how do we come to an agreement when two parties are trying to meet on the merger of a practice? Uh, we don't value practices on a, for the most part, an appraiser will do that. But we do give advice to our clients when we're looking at them and saying, what is, what is this practice worth? They want us to come buy their practice. And recently I had a client uh, who was looking to buy another practice, and so they approached the practice. It was an older uh, physician practicing in the current, in the current practice. Uh, two younger physicians wanted to buy his practice. He was ready to sell it. Uh, we asked for a price, you know, what, what, do you, what do you think your practice is worth? He threw out a number of about a million and a half. And we said, on what basis do you think it's worth a million and a half? And he said, because I think it's worth a million and a half. And I said, well, that's pretty typical. Uh, we, our 
client said, well, we need you to value that practice and, and go in there and see if it's worth. At the end of the day, we told the practice that it was worth nothing. It was worth nothing more than the referral sources that that client w was able to give to our clients. It didn't have anything. Uh, and if, if we could value those referral sources, great. If that position was going to stick around for a while and help transition those referral sources over to our client, we would be willing to pay some type of prices, price for that. But just to come in and buy that practice straight out for a million and a half dollars, patients are gone. Uh, you're not going to get those. Not, not going to get those. So part of that conversation is, depending on what side of the table you're on, how do we transition? How do we set up so that we can get some value out of our practice? Because that's what we, that's what we need to talk about. How do we set up a buy-sell agreement? How do we bring someone in? How do we sell it to another party? And so we often talk about grooming a purchaser. Uh, that's the terminology we, we use. Uh, if you are currently looking to sell your practice in three months from now, you're probably out of luck. Uh, you, you just don't have a, unless you've got some buyer in line that wants to buy your patient base. But if you're looking to sell your practice in 18 months or 24 months or 36 months, you still have time to groom a purchaser because most likely your money is built up in your referral sources, your patient base, and your ability to transfer that patient base and referrals to the next person. The value for them is in that same mentoring stage, the same stage of the transfer. So when you're looking at it, when you're looking at someone, you've got to find someone, one, to come into your practice that's willing to uh, act as a non-owner for a while, which there's many residents out there ready to do that. Uh, two, that wants to actually own the practice one day and sees the benefits of doing that. And then three, one that's willing to pay over time, transfer some money over to pay for the practice. So this is how we would normally structure this deal. Uh, we would bring in a successor, set them up on a, on a salary. Uh, let's, just, let's just throw round numbers here. $200,000 we're going to pay you in a base salary. And you're going to come in and work just, just as hard, five days, four, four or five days a week. At a $200,000 salary, I would like to see production or, or uh, production on the books at some point of maybe four times that. So they can produce in revenues of $800,000, which means there's a $600,000 gap in there that goes to cover overhead. It also goes to you as the seller over time. They come in and work year one, we pay them 200 and they produce $800,000. Now this is assuming we've got some new patients and they're not cannibalizing your current patients. If they are cannibalizing your current patient, that's okay too. That just means you probably have a little more work-life balance than you did previously, and now this new physician's doing it. So now we have a $600,000 gap in there that we're willing to take is, is, is one, either a, a, pay, a payment term, that, that can work, or two, is just a gap over time. So if we can get that person to have a $600,000 gap for year one and year two, if, if effectively they've paid us $1.2 million for the practice. That might be sufficient for you as you transfer that money into your pocket. If it's not, and, it, and oftentimes it's not what you want, then what we do in year three, we allow them to buy in. And at year three, we say, well, buy-in price is going to be a certain price, and the, the practice can be appraised, and or we can give a value of what it's going to be. And oftentimes, the buy-sell agreement dictates what the, what the price will be, and then they buy in over time. The other part of that is their accounts receivable. We've got the accounts receivable that they've worked as an employee up until a time frame. So they're going to buy in on July 1. They've got all these accounts receivable that are technically owned by the current practice. They're not an owner yet. So they have to buy those receivables, especially if we're going to put those receivables in their column whenever we compensate. So if a, if a physician's buying into a practice, he'll be the fifth owner. There's $100,000 of AR, just to use a round number. Mm -hmm. So he'd be buying $20,000. So he, when he buys in, he would be purchasing $20,000 of AR. That's right. And, and as that money's collected, we will give him, them credit for it, but we will also transfer $20,000 from his compensation period, his compensation column, however that's structured, into the owner's compensa comp uh, compensation structure so that we receive that money. Uh, the other part is if the practice does have some value, when they come in as an owner, they're going to make more money. Uh, the eight hundred dollars to $200,000 example, let's assume a 50% overhead, which means at the end of the day, their bottom line take home pay would be about $400,000. Um, well, they're going to make $400,000, but we're going to make them pay into our practice over time. And let's say our practice is worth, and I'm throwing a lot of numbers out here for you, let's say our practice is worth half a million dollars. 
but we'll, we'll tell them that they can pay us $100,000 of their $400,000 over the next five years. And that's how that's structured. So now you get a $500,000 uh, shift of income for you, and they buy it out over time. They don't have to finance that deal. They don't have to go out to the bank to do it. They do it as they work it out. Why is that a good deal for the, for the, for the actual buyer? Is because for over that five-year period, they're going to ramp up and you're going to ramp down, which means at the end of the day, all your production hopefully will transfer into their column. They get your patients. You take them around on rounds with you. You introduce them to new patients. You advertise them, market them. That's part of what the value in the practice is at the end of the day. And so now we've got a buyer. They pay our price. They've got a good deal because they're going to make 400000 plus whatever you were making if they can successfully handle all of your patients at the end of the day, and they didn't have to come out of pocket in any way. That only works if you can transition over time. It also only works if you are a superior income producer. And you may or may not know if you are a superior income producer. The best way to look at that, and we do this, is to look at benchmarks of how you, of how you stand. So we could take you, look at your production, look at your compensation, and tell you where you fall on the benchmark of national data. We could also look at your state and tell you where you fall. Are you in the 50 percentile? the 60 percentile, if you're up in the 95 percentile, you've got something to sell. Uh, these, these residents coming out or whoever wants to buy your practice, even if it's a merger, you've got something to sell because you're a superior income earner, which means you have superior uh, patient volume, you're doing something right and someone's willing to pay for it to get that future cash flow stream. You've got to know what's going on in your practice to even set these, the compensation plan for the potential buy-in or for the, the future owner. Um, you know, if, if you don't know what your overhead is in your practice, if you don't know where your money's going, also if you, you're not going to be able to set the compensation for this for this uh, new owner and be able to make money off of them for the period of time unless you know what, what's going on in your practice and you're up to date and up to speed on the financial statements. And also, you know, we mentioned uh, EMRs earlier and the difficulty with those and, you know, some some physicians are opting not to do that and, and try to sell their practice. If, if you think about you know the residents that are coming out today they're not going to want to buy a practice that's not you know up to date on the current technology they're going to want a practice that has the an emr that's easy to work with and implemented and uh they're, they're not going to want to pay or buy in or pay a premium for a practice where they're going to have to do a lot of work to get things up to speed that's right so we talked about a, a little bit that we kind of combined a buy sell agreement what it looks like usually the components of a buy-sell agreement, the stock purchase and the AR, those are usually the biggest two parts of a buy-in or a buy-out. Uh, same thing, everything we just mentioned on a buy-in is the same way you would buy out of it. So at the end of the day, whatever the value of the practice is, either through appraisal, because you may have some goodwill in there, if you think your practice is more, worth more than these tables and chairs, or if it's just the value of the practice, that's the way you'd be bought out, dictated by the buy-sell agreement. And usually just pay it over a certain amount of time from the actual purchaser itself. The other part, the accounts receivable works both ways. So when you buy, usually when you buy into a practice, you don't own your AR. When you buy out, you do own your AR, and someone's gonna have to purchase you out as that as that money's collected. Uh, there's some various methods that we use whenever you're buying out someone's AR. Yeah, and generally, you know, the stock purchase that we're talking about, that's done within a practice from a physician to physician sale. If you have a hospital involved, you're more than likely going to have a uh, formal valuation performed on your practice and I'm going to outline what's involved in that but in general you know if you're just kicking around ideas there's some informal ways to value a practice uh, one of those is comparative sales which is really hard to get information on because it's not public information when a practice does sell uh, but there is a, a book called a goodwill registry that lists sales of medical practices by specialty by location by year and you can get an idea of what the uh, practices are selling for. Now, not everyone reports that information to the Goodwill Registry, so there's a lot of information not in there. I bet physicians that sell for less than what they're, they're happy about probably don't submit their information to those books. But uh, the Goodwill Registry will tell you how many physicians are in the practice, what specialty it is, and uh, sometimes it'll provide uh, the gross revenues of that practice for a year. And it can kind of give you a ballpark idea of what practice sell for, but we very rarely use that because it, it is very uh, segmented into locations and you know what a practice sells for in Birmingham 
is not comparable to what a practice sells for in Texas necessarily. And there's a lot of information you don't know. So comparative sales is one way, but it's not used very often and not reliable. The other, other way is a rule of thumb. And that's, you know, a practice has $5 million of, of collections for a year. Someone may say, oh, 40% of that number is what a, a practice is worth. Well, that may work on one practice, but you compare that to another specialty, another group, um, there's just so many factors that go into the value of a medical practice that a rule of thumb is not going to apply uh, to everyone, and it can be very dangerous to, to use that as a basis for calculating a value. Yeah, I mean, I think a rule of thumb is, is dangerous because if you take your different specialties, let's say you take a, a cataract surgeon, you know, and use a rule of thumb on what they're worth, well, a cataract surgeon works solely off of referrals, off of referrals from optometrists. So if we use a rule of thumb for a cataract sur surgeon, that's not exactly going to work. If we do a multiple of five, it's not going to work the same way as you would have a family practitioner because we're not working off a referral base. So that's the dangerous part of using a rule of thumb. Yeah. And the, the, the real formal way to value a practice when it's necessary in the situations where it might be necessary or a hospital's involved or it's outlined in a buy-sell agreement that a val uh, valuation has to be performed. Uh, those are the situations where you would need an independent uh, certified valuation expert to come in and, and do a report and say this is what or provide a range of what they believe the practice is, is worth. And uh, when that report is, is performed and provided, uh, there's going to be a couple different ways, really three different ways and methods that the, the practice is valued. The first of, of those is the asset approach and as we mentioned before, a medical practice it's generally a cash basis entity and keep the books on tax basis. That does not reflect the true fair market value of your AR or your equipment. And it also doesn't factor in the value of the patient records or the workforce you have in your practice. So in the, by workforce, I mean the other physicians in your practice, uh, a nurse practitioner, LPN, all those, those people that you've assembled and put into your practice. Uh, what would it cost someone to put a practice together and assemble those people. You'd have to pay a recruiter, you have to pay recruiting fees, you may have to pay someone to move, um, HR costs of getting all that generated. So a, a workforce that's in place is a valuable thing. Uh, all these components are uh, part of the asset approach and that's just one of the methods that is used in a formal valuation to determine what the fair market value of your practice would be. And like Say mentioned earlier, we'll reiterate a little bit, you know, the qualified appraisal of your fixed assets, when we're looking at the equity of a business, uh, of a medical practice, uh, we may buy a ultrasound machine and for $120,000. And we may take accelerated depreciation, that term's thrown around a lot, section 179, and bring it all the way down to zero as far as a book basis. Uh, we wanted, if they spent $120,000 spend $120, in cash, we probably want to go ahead and try to match up the depreciation deduction with the actual expenditure of the cash. Which means if we look on your books, it's worth zero. And we know that a you know, one-year-old ultrasound machine is, has a lot more value than that. And that's why oftentimes a qualified appraisal or a methodology is used where, A, we're going to take whatever your assets are at cost and use 30% or 40% or 50% uh, because you will have some stuff that you bought in 1986 that, lat, that that exam table that you just can't give up even though it doesn't even move up or down anymore. Uh, but uh, there are those items that you have in there. Hopefully you don't have a 1986 computer that you still use. Um, but uh, there are items that are going to take into consideration that so oftentimes we'll say 40% is a good number. Uh, but again, that's got to be dictated either through your buy-sell agreement or a methodology that has been used historical for your practice so that it, whatever you bought in for, we'd like to match out on how you're bought out, bought out from. So uh, that's one of those items as part of the asset approach that we'll look at. Mm -hmm. another, another, another approach is the market approach. It's very similar to what I already talked about, the Goodwill Registry. It's basically comparing uh, similar sales of practices and, and trying to glean a value from you know what other practices have sold for. In a formal valuation report, if you see this used, there's probably something wrong with the report. This is very seldom used for a basis for establishing a value. Uh, it's usually either the asset approach or the income approach, which is what I'm going to talk about next. Um, the income approach uses the 
performance of your practice, an income statement, the revenues and expenses, and projects a value based on the historical performance of your practice. And generally what's done is it takes the prior year, or prior couple of years of uh, income and expenses and projects out maybe five years and determines what the cash flow, what the profit is from each of those years and does an, a calculation to determine what the present value of those earnings are. And it's important to have a, a valuation expert that's very familiar with medical practices and the healthcare industry, especially in this approach, because there's so many different, different things that they need to be aware of when looking at your practice and the revenues, expenses, and what could change in the future. If they're not up, up to speed on what's going on with reimbursements uh, for your, your specialty, if they don't know um, the difference between uh, an LPN and RN, uh, if they don't know the difference between a, just a lot of the, the things that are particular to your practice and are not able to project those costs out into the future, you're going to run into some problems with the, the value that's uh, determined under the income approach. Now, generally what's done is they look at the revenues and they do what's called normalizing those revenues. So in the future, let's say next year, you know that your, your top procedure is gonna take a, a, a cut of 5%, then that would need to be factored in for the future cash flow projection. Um, also, if you're basing you know, this year's cash flow, you're using this year to project the, the future year, um, they, they need to be aware of any anomalies that happened in the current year, like if you got incentive money uh, in that year. If there was a billing issue in December of the prior year and that money wasn't collected until January and you, and you collected two months of, of, uh, of work in, in January of that year, things like that need to be identified to normalize the, the revenues. Um, you also need to normalize the expenses and one thing that we often look for when doing this is looking for hidden physician expenses. Um, a lot of times physicians have their personal expenses kind of intermingled in the expenses of the practice. It could be meals and entertainment, it could be auto expenses, uh, life insurance, it, you know, a lot of different things that could be in there. Those need to be identified, pulled out, and, uh, and adjusted to normalize the expenses for the practice. There's also things that a uh, practice might have that are one-time expenses like, like equipment, repairs, uh, settling a lawsuit, anything that is a one-time expense that's not going to recur needs to be adjusted for as well. Uh, also in this approach, you're going to be comparing the practice's uh, expenses and revenues to NGMA benchmarks to identify anything that looks unusual so, that, so those can be uh, identified and smoothed out. Uh, so if you had a preferred method on those three, say, what, would you, what was your preferred The income method? approach is usually the, the best method because the value of a practice, when you get down to it, is how much money is going to go in the pocket of the owner, and that's the cash flow, and that's what you're valuing in the income approach is how much money, you know, what's, what's this pr practice worth based on these assumptions and the cash that's going to go to the owners in the future years. So the income approach is generally the, the approach that is the, the most reliable value of the practice. That's right. Um, why don't you talk about the tax implications of, you know, trying to buy goodwill versus just when we just look at the stock purchase and how those two coincide together. Well, I'll talk about it from a seller's perspective. We'll, you know, as an owner of a medical practice, you sell your practice to another physician. Uh, you're either going to be selling, as we mentioned, stock or you're going to be selling the assets. Of, the, of your practice. And when you sell stock, stock is considered a capital asset for income tax purposes. And that's going to result in capital gains. And capital gain has preferential tax rate compared to ordinary income. Ordinary income is generally what would happen if you were to sell your assets. And I'm just talking in general terms here, every transaction is going to be different. But uh, just to you know keep it simple for these purposes, uh, stock sale is going to have most likely likely 20 percent income tax rate whereas if you sell your assets you could potentially have ordinary income on a portion or a significant amount of that sale and that could be ordinary income at 39.6 percent 
income tax rate. So the structure when you're selling your practice to consult with your tax advisor and figure out what's the best way for me to handle this is very important because it can mean thousands and thousands of dollars at the end of the day and can be a big factor in how you, you transition and, and dispose of your practice. Yep. So if we put that in a short synopsis, every seller wants to sell their um, goodwill. They want, the, they want the value to be mostly goodwill because they get capital treatment on that. Right. Um, every buyer wants the, the transaction to be more of the assets because when they buy the assets, they get to write that off as ordinary and at a faster timetable than if they bought goodwill. If they buy goodwill, that deduction has to be amortized usually over 15 years of buying the goodwill. And that takes a long time. If you expend a million dollars in cash and then you have to wait 15 years to write, to buy off that uh, write off that deduction, you're going to have a cash flow crunch at some point. So the structuring, the nature of those deal, you're going to have two parties fighting. And if you're not advised on the proper tax treatment of it, uh, you may come out on the uh, raw end of the deal, if you will. And also outlining in the purchase agreement exactly what is being purchased and at what price so that the taxable transaction be, can, can be considered properly and, and handled properly. Um, I think some other things to consider here in just the overall scheme of buying and selling your practices. One is uh, your tail coverage. You know, who pays for that tail coverage? How long does that tail coverage last? Uh, we talked about uh, income taxes already and the ramifications of income taxes under all of these approaches. Uh, another one that uh, often comes up with is the custodianship of patient charts. You know, who's, what do you do with the patient charts? Who's going to maintain the patient charts after the practice either closed down, shut, merged, sold? Uh, that can be an expen expensive venture if it's not done. You know, keeping those off site, pulling them for patients, transferring patient charts. Uh, of course, this, we're talking mostly about paper at this point, but that's what most of our older charts are going to be unless you've transitioned and got everything into EMR. Even that can be can be some issues, uh, but that, that those are some issues that are other things to consider whenever you're looking at or to buy or sell your medical practice. Um, as a as a recap of what we've discussed tonight, um, we talked about the three or four or five items that are driving the change uh, for buying or selling your medical practice. We also talked about the importance of having a buy sell agreement and, and why that's important whenever you're ready to buy or sell. Uh, the aspects of a buy sell agreement, the stock, the stock purchase, the accounts receivable you need to look at, and then lastly, the ways to value your practice and, and what is your practice worth, what are the various methods that are used to typically uh, purchase or sell a practice. Maybe that's all we have, unless we have some questions. Uh, I would encourage you, if you're watching live here, to you can send in your questions. I think that's been. Uh, told on the webinar how to, to send those in. Randy will let us know if there are any questions. Okay. Do we have the current slide up with, say, you know, our information in case someone has a, uh, just can jot that down and have any questions? Absolutely. Okay. Well, I don't see any questions yet, Mandy. So if you if you just want to wrap it up, that'll be fine. And uh, if someone has questions, you're welcome. You have our contact information on any of this subject. Whenever you uh, come up with one of that those wise questions, feel free to reach out to Say or myself. All right. Very good. Well, we thank you, Maddox and Say, very much for all the great information. And thank you to our viewers for joining us today. And in about a week, you'll be able to access this on-demand video um, so you can review any material that you missed or simply want to go over again. And uh, we thank our partners again, Warren Averett, Jefferson County Medical Society, and SMA Services, Inc. for making this program possible. And we ask you to visit these websites for additional information and about their programs and services. Also, um, this is uh, Maddox and Say's contact information. Uh, if you have any questions whatsoever, they have said please feel free to call or email they're more than willing to get with you one-on-one -on -one and, and discuss any uh, additional questions or go into further detail with you. 
And then I also wanted to let you know briefly that we've got a few more programs in this series coming up. If you haven't already seen the dates and the locations, they are, should be showing on your screen now. Um, we also have a website. The uh, URL is at the bottom of the screen. Uh, please feel free to visit it and um, read up a little bit more detail, and we hope you'll plan to join us. And thank you again for being with us, and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.